we're looking at, the, the title would be Life or Death, The Choice is Yours. And I'm not speaking from Deuteronomy, where that uh, was also a very famous quote of, you know, I'm giving you a life and death, so choose life. Now I'm taking a little bit different slant on it today. The 15th reading from the Torah is named Bo, which means come, or in context can mean go. It, uh, the title comes from the, the first words of the first verse of the reading, which says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Come or go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart. It's kind of interesting there, the, the, the take on the, the word uh, bow. Okay, I just happened to think of this because it can be, you know, generally we think of the word bow as what? Come. Come, Holy Spirit. You know, that's the way we sang the song. Okay, come, Holy Spirit. Um, <clears throat> so God is telling Moses, hey, come to Pharaoh. Well, why is that? Uh, why, you know, normally you would say go to Pharaoh, but this time he's saying come to Pharaoh. Why is that? Because God is already there with Pharaoh, and he says, hey, come on in here, Moses. We got some talking to do. And so God is already there. This portion begins the, uh, by concluding the narrative of the ten plagues, the last three uh, plagues, the tenth of which is the slaying of the firstborn. Now, to avoid the plague, the Israelites are given instructions for the Passover sacrifice and the laws of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Now, Pharaoh finally consents, and he lets Israel go, and they they uh, they leave Egypt. And there's another uh, little phrase where it says, you know, we've always heard it, let my people go. But the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew is actually send my people out is, if, is a more correct rendering of it. But uh, somehow we've gotten our translations over the years that says let my people go. But God is saying, you know, send my people out. <coughs> this particular Parsha has several well-known incidents that um, are actually foundational in our belief systems, whether we're Jews, Messianic Jews, Messianic believers, or Christians, one's understanding of the events surrounding Passover or Pesach, the Hebrew word, depends entirely on your perspective regarding the Messiah. Now, the Jewish person will look at this and see only the idea of Passover in the, in the Passover lamb, whereas the Messianic would look at this and being the, the Passover, of course. Also, this is the Passover lamb being Yeshua. Now, generally, the Christian would look at this and uh, they would agree that the Passover lamb is Jesus or Yeshua, but they don't really internalize the story <clears throat> of Passover as being personal for themselves. To most Christians, it's a Jewish holiday. And, you know, I've, I've, uh, each year we try to have a corporate Passover for and invite to people from outside our immediate community. And uh, I'd asked, the, I was doing a teaching next door, and uh, I'd asked people, uh, are you going to um, um, come to the Passover uh, deal? And one lady says, no, I don't need to go. I've already been once. And uh, so I asked her, I said, well, did you eat breakfast this morning? And she said, yes. And I said, well, good. Then you don't have to ever eat breakfast again, do you? And she, I think she got my point. It's something we do every year. <coughs> the Jewish people look at Passover as extremely personal. And we get, uh, and we, you know, we put ourselves in the place of the early Israelites as if we were actually there too. The, uh, today, I'd like to put some of these views together in kind of a, a, a cohesive story that would include the Jewish view of things, the Messianic view of things, and the Christian view of things. Now, for the Jew, the story of Passover is a historical ob uh, observation that is remembered every year. It tells the story of Moses being called by God to lead the Israelites to freedom. A perfect livestock lamb was slain to provide blood that was to be splashed on the doorposts and uh, the lintel of their, of their dwellings. If the people did what Hashem commanded, then the angel of death would pass over 
their homes and no harm would come to them uh, uh, to their firstborn. And there, that's how we get, of course, the, the term Passover. Most Egyptians chose not to follow God's commandment. They suffered the consequences of losing their firstborn. The edict was carried out from the lowest hovel in, you know, the poorest people in Egypt all the way up to the palace of Pharaoh. So did the relief from death apply to others outside of Israel? Did, how about that? Did, did others outside of Israel, did they have a choice? Did they have the opportunity to put blood on their doorpost? Or was that just a Jewish thing? We can't know for sure, but Scripture tells us that there was a large amount of people called the mixed multitude, that they were, they were there also with the Israelites when they left Egypt. And uh, <clears throat> it seems most likely that anyone who went with B'nai Israel would have also had enough faith to cover their doorposts with the markings prescribed by the Israelite God. I'm thinking they were, they were seeing what was happening to Egypt and the plagues and that they looked over there and see what was happening to Israel and not having to suffer through the plagues. And they figured, I'm going to hitch my wagon over here to the, to the Israelite God and not to this, this bunch of gods here in, in Egypt, you know, the frog and the, and the, the cows and the uh, whatever kind of, of, of uh, gods that they had. So I think it's possible that the population as a whole could have avoided that tenth plague if they put the blood on their doorpost. I do believe that God would have provided a sanctuary. He would have provided salvation or from and freedom from that death angel if even the Egyptians had put the, the, the blood on their doorpost. They had a choice. Now, the sages tell us that only about 20% of the population of Israel chose to leave Egypt. And, uh, you know, why would that be? Why did only 20% of the Israelites follow God's commandments? Did the other 80% fail to, uh, to listen to God? And, and uh, when, you know, when, when he says put the, the blood on the doorpost and the result, you know, and as a result, decided not to follow Hashem into the desert because if they didn't put the door, or the blood on the doorpost, then they lost their firstborn, even if they were Israelites. We don't know, but it is an interesting question. The Egyptians, the mixed multitudes, and all of Israel had a choice to make. They could follow God's commandments and have life or disregard his commandments and suffer the consequences of death. When the sun rose over uh, Egypt on the 15th of Nisan, there were two emotions present in the land. In all of Egypt, there was wailing and crying for over the loss of their firstborn children. But in Goshen, where the Israelites left, there was a different sound. It was a sound of preparation, a sound of excitement. For you see, when the Israelites killed the lamb, splashed the blood on the doorposts, they were slaves in a foreign land. They were still slaves when they put all of that stuff on. But when the light dawned on Goshen, the people of Israel were no longer slaves. They were free. They had, God had broken their bonds, their bondage, and they were a nation of free men and women. The blood made the difference. It was their choice. They chose life. Now, today we hear much about choice. <clears throat> The biggest one, you know, here in the U.S. is what? A woman's right to choose, all right? In the, in the coming weeks, the Supreme Court will be looking at some cases involving abortion. It's incumbent upon each one of us to, uh, who are believers to be in prayer about this because this is very important to our nation. Since the landmark decision of Roe v. Wade in uh, 1973, over 63 million babies have been murdered in the United States in abortion clinics. The most evil organization that I can think of in the United States right now is Planned Parenthood. The guys make the, these you know, Planned Parenthood folks, they, they make the Holocaust, Stalin, Genghis Khan, and Molech 
look like choir boys when compared to how many babies they have murdered in planned, uh, you know, in these Planned Parenthood clinics. In Israel, one must get a, um, go through a three-panel committee approval for abortion, but once it's approved, it's covered by the government and funding until age uh, 33. Now, out of a population of over uh, 8 million, about 20,000 20, abortions are performed in Israel annually. It's not good. I can't help but wonder sometimes if the troubles some, that we get into in the United States and in Israel are somehow connected to our utter disregard for the most innocent among us. Clearly, the abortion industry and their supporters in government choose to put the wrong blood on the doorposts. <clears throat> the, uh, the drosh that uh, I delivered on Christmas morning regarding the date of Yeshua's birth, it, uh, it reached over 2,600 people. And some, you know, some people agreed, some people disagreed, some shrugged it off and said, meh, whatever. Um, but that figure of 2,600 views was a wake-up call for me because most of the things that I say in here are targeted to those who are sitting right here. You know, it's a face-to-face -face thing I'm targeting you guys. And so as a result, I'm largely focused on believers and, and uh, the lives that you lead. And this week, I, felt, I really felt an urging by the, the God's Spirit to expand my, my look a little bit. A lot. Change the focus and speak to the hundreds. There's hundreds of them out there who watch this service at home. And many have not accepted Yeshua as their personal Savior. So I'm speaking both to believers and those who are not. Jew, Gentile, Christians, Muslims, it doesn't matter. I, uh, to anyone that has ears, let him hear. We have often discussed the problems people have as they, as they live their lives. Many are burdened with addictions, depressions, bad habits, destructive relationships. You know, the list goes on. We could talk about that a lot. Somewhere in our lives, each one of us is faced with a choice, a life-changing choice. Maybe you chose to, uh, to smoke that first cigarette or pop some kind of a pill or uh, entertain that first kiss that you knew would lead to destruction. Okay, you started hanging with people who support your choices because it was fun or exciting or just to escape the discomfort of your own reality. It doesn't really matter how or when, uh, you know, these, these decisions were made. Bad choices bring about bad results. In computer language, what, how do we say that? Garbage in, garbage out, right? I don't know if they still say that or not, but... Uh, I know when I was punching IBM cards back 50 years ago, that's, that really was a thing. That was it. Garbage in, garbage out. Eventually, bad choices which result in bad consequences will destroy your life, your job, your family. Let's face it. Our choices can make us just as much a slave to sin as the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. Now, you may have experienced many plagues in your life with, uh, with no Moses to lead you out. Could be. But there is a way out. I said I would connect the dots between Judaism, Messianic Judaism, and Christianity. Jews look at the Passover lamb as a historical fact. The death of the lamb was necessary to provide the blood to put over the doorposts. Jewish tradition does not ascribe any messianic significance to the lamb. However, for traditional Christians and for us as messianic believers, we look at the lamb differently. The prophet Isaiah spoke of the Messiah as a lamb in 50, uh, 50, Isaiah 53, 7. He says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep before his shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. <clears throat> when Yochanan the Immerser, that's John the Baptist, was uh, preaching and immersing repentant Jews in the Jordan River, he saw Yeshua coming and he declared, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Rav Shaul, the, the Apostle Paul, spoke of Yeshua this way, 
For Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Now, Peter equated the blood of Messiah with the, with the Passover lamb in 1 Peter 1.19. But the precious blood like that of a lamb without defect or spot, the blood of Messiah. So for those of us who are believers in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the Passover lamb takes on a monumental significance. The Passover lamb in Egypt was significant because it was separated from, uh, it separated those that believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from those who did not. It was very simple. That Passover lamb, if you, if you slaughtered that Passover lamb, put the, the blood up there, that you were saying, yes, I believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm one of his. And when that pass, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, you know, th that Passover lamb, now get me straight here, the Passover lamb in Egypt did not save anyone from their sins. All right, you got that? It did not save them from their sins. It was a vehicle to physically save the Israelites from the horrors of losing their firstborn children. But they were still not absolved from their sins. They were then set free from the bondage of Pharaoh. That was the freedom that they had, but they still had their sins. The difference is that the lamb could not remove the sins. Only the blood of one born of God who lived a sinless life could be the agent who removed their sins and uh, their sins and our sins. Now Hebrews 10, 4 says, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. This passage was speaking of the sacrifices of the temple system. Those sacrifices were but a covering. David prophetically spoke of the Messiah and sin in Psalms uh, 103. It says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. East to west. I talk about this all the time. Um, that, that means your sins are gone as far from one infinity to the other. There's no circling back, you know, if, if, if from east to west. Whereas if there was north to south, if the Bible had said, okay, as far as the north is from the south, that's how far your sins are from you. That's a pretty long way. If you've ever, you know, <clears throat> those, uh, uh, those of us who have sailed the seas and maybe crossed that Arctic Circle and then gone back down to the Antarctic Circle and around uh, Cape Horn and, and so forth, that's a, that's, and it's real cold down there, let me tell you. Um, it's a long way. It's, uh, but... I can show you where the North Pole is. You can actually measure it and see. And you can also go to the South Pole in Antarctica and see the South Pole. And knowing that you're right there on the axis of where the Earth spins. But there are no East and West Poles. That means that... Uh, your sins are gone because it's when it goes to the east or to the west, they're going to be gone that way, and never, ever, ever are they going to meet again. Now, they're you know, I'm not a mathematician, but I do believe that infinity is a long way away. It's a lot longer than from the North Pole to the South Pole. That's how far our sins are from it. That's the effectiveness of that blood of Yeshua. This morning, all of us need God's forgiveness. Now, if you're, a, if you're a human like me, you have sin in your life. It's just the way it is. It's easy to become a slave to addictions, bad habits, evil thoughts, you know, whatever's troubling you. You don't have to live a life of slavery. Now, the Israelites started their Passover meal. You know, they had that, that little roasted lamb. And they started that meal as slaves. But Baruch Hashem, praise God, when the sun came up that next morning, they were no longer slaves. They were free. And just like them, we need to be set free. Every day, 
We need to paint the doorposts of our hearts with the blood of Yeshua. <coughs> Do you ever think of, well, you look at this sign here, and it's, I guess that's the way the lentils would have looked. I don't know. They painted the stuff on there. But did you ever stop to think that when they put that blood on the right hand and on the left hand and up on the top, and it dripped down and there's on the bottom, what else, where else do we see that kind of blood? Anybody? On the cross. You see the cross, you got the, the blood on the sides, you got the blood from his crown and the, uh, the blood in his feet. Remarkable symbolism. Yeshua's sacrifice only needed to happen once uh, to absolve the world of sin. But we have to choose, every, you know, his sacrifice. We choose his sacrifice every day. Apply the blood to your addictions, to your afflictions, to whatever it is that's troubling you. Splash his blood on the doorpost of your home and every aspect of your life. You can wake up to a new day as a free person, free from the sins that weigh you down. You know, it's just... Every morning, there's, you know, there's, there, is a, uh, there is a prayer that uh, in, in Judaism called the Modani. And uh, it basically, it, it says, thank you, Lord, that we are, that I've been resurrected. Because going to sleep is kind of like going to, you know, in death. And then you're resurrected again. And then the Bible also says his mercies are new every day. Every day they're renewed. We're new creations. And uh, so that, that idea that we need to stay focused on the, the sacrifice that Yeshua made for us. We can all of us, every one of us, be free from the sins that weigh us down. 